grace and peace to each of you. As many of you know, the taping of this service took place three weeks ago, just days before the events surrounding the murder of George Floyd. Since that time, so much has taken place that now more than ever, we understand the need to address systemic racism in our culture, our country, and in our church. Many have expressed deep lament. Others have expressed significant anger and frustration. Still others have hoped that it would just quickly go away. But you and I know it will not go away, and it should not go away. We need to come alongside those who have for so long endured the pain of systemic racism and say together, enough is enough. We need to give voice to those who have felt unheard and to listen deeply. We need to examine systems and structures that for too long have suppressed people's gifts and abilities. This cannot be just another flash in the pan, friends. It can't just be another study or task force or book that, to be read. It has to be more. The door has been opened and it's time to act. In his town hall meeting last week, President Obama reflected that there's something different with the protests that are being conducted across the world today than the ones that were carried out in the 1960s. Today, there is a diverse group of people of all colors and ages and backgrounds who are saying that enough is enough and something has to change. And there's a clear need for us as religious leaders to incorporate what we know and do best into the conversation. It is not time for us to just hold a Bible, but to open it and use it and draw upon the words that call us to action that offer us forgiveness, and that bring us hope in the midst of despair and confusion. Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy, the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, said it best. She writes, Scripture is clear that God is not impressed by prayers unaccompanied by sustained efforts to create a more loving world. That hearkens that phrase from the Bible, let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. Scripture is clear. Buddy writes, Justice, which is the societal expression of love, matters most to our God. Justice is also what is most important to those who are exercising their right to peacefully protest. You see, Scripture informs us, and it expresses what we all know to be true. It is long past time to fix a law that allows police officers and vigilantes to go unpunished for crimes against people of color. It is long past time to correct the gross disparities that health care has uh, been revealed through the COVID-19 pandemic. It's very long past time to change economic and educational systems that privilege white people. I could not agree more with or say it any better than Bishop Buddy when she says, There are times when taking a side and a stand is precisely what's needed from people of faith. For me, now is such a time. I stand with those engaged in peaceful protest, those that are calling for meaningful change, and especially with young Americans who rightly wonder if there is hope for their future. This is a crucible moment. By grace and with courage, I believe that we can rise to meet it, and we must. The God I serve is on the side of justice. Jesus calls his followers to emulate his example of sacrificial love and to be what he called the kingdom of God on earth. I pledge to come alongside, of those, alongside those of you who have for far too long felt unheard and marginalized. I pledge to keep the conversation, the words and the actions in front of us and to not let it fade. I pledge to lead with you and for you. And I pledge as a part of that leadership to admit mistakes, seek forgiveness, and to listen deeply. One of the most impactful statements I heard in recent days has come from the rapper activist Killer Mike. In a recent interview, Stephen Colbert asked him what white Americans could do right now. 
Part of it, Killer Mike said, was, and I quote, understand that right now is always. There's a real need to confess to the black community that as white people, we have not always understood that the emotions you are experiencing in relationship to the murder of George Floyd, the right now, is something that you've always felt and daily experienced. It's time for us to join together to name the sin, seek forgiveness and reconciliation, and pledge to work together to end the enormous disparities caused by racism. We cannot be distracted by those who want to dilute the conversation or divert it to something else. As Bishop Buddy says, the path of lasting change isn't easy, and we won't always get it right. But if we keep our eyes fixed on what matters most, we can refuse to be distracted by lesser things. This is our prayer, and this is my hope, and this is my pledge. Something that's also critical and must be dealt with alongside the urgency of this moment is the ongoing struggle to deal with and recover from the coronavirus. All of us in one way or another have been impacted by it. And the convergence of these two events have begun to write a chapter that will most certainly evolve into a new normal that none of us can quite predict. But all of it is opening doors of new possibility for mission, ministry, and service. This pandemic has placed a real burden on the shoulders of our pastors. The daily challenges of shepherding a congregation and placing the burdens of people's needs and care on their shoulders is not easy. The work that our pastors have had to do in these past three months has added a new level of stress that none of us could predict. So many in leadership are ill-equipped to deal with what they've faced and what they will be facing. Because of that, I felt that it was important to acknowledge that the self-care of a pastor must be a vital consideration and a key focus for those of us who have responsibility for the oversight, safety, and well-being of our clergy. This is the reason why I chose to take this weekend, the four days when we would have been at annual conference, and provide a four-day period of respite and renewal for our pastors, a time to pull away, to rest, read, pray, reflect, and prepare without the pressures of preparing a service or a sermon for this one week, and a time to seek the strength necessary for the days that lie ahead. I'm really pleased that our team here at 20 Soundview has provided this worship experience for you. And I'm also very pleased to offer the pulpit for this service to our Director of Congregational Development and Revitalization, David Gilmore. This opportunity represents a very inadequate but appropriate way to acknowledge and express our gratitude to David for his service among us. As many of you know, David is returning home to Kansas City, Missouri to become the District Superintendent of the Heartland District that includes Kansas City. Our loss is surely Missouri Conference's gain, as David has provided exceptional vision and leadership in our cabinet, among our local churches, and to various regions within the annual conference where new and creative ministries have been initiated. I have asked David to be the preacher for this service as a way of providing us with one last opportunity to hear from him of how God's Word and God's will should inform our ministry here in the New York Annual Conference. David will be leaving us in mid-July to begin his new responsibilities. I hope that you'll join me in thanking him by showering David with cards, letters, and other words of thanks for his amazing work in our midst. And I wish we could have done that in person. And what we will do will pale in comparison to what we should do to say thank you to a person who has been faithful, energetic, and deeply committed to our people and our churches. Now, as we prepare to worship, would you just pause for a moment, silently reflect to God your words of praise and thanksgiving, and join me as we together worship the Lord.
How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O Lord of hosts, my ruler and my God, at your altars even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. Behold our shield, O God. Look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your court is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield and bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed are those who trust in you. Amen. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, verses 37 through 42. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Here ends the reading. May God bless it in our hearing. I greet you in the name of Jesus and want to offer my heartfelt thanks to our bishop, Thomas J. Bickerton, for this opportunity, this invitation to proclaim the word of God. I love you, and I pray that this message touches someone's soul. Will you pray with me and pray for me at this time? God of grace and God of mercy, I pause right now thanking you for another opportunity to proclaim your word. Use me, Lord, in thy service and fill me with something that will offer hope to your people. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to spend just a few moments today on the subject of going. Before the rising sun we fly, so many roads to choose. We'll start out walking and learn to run, and yes, we've just begun. Sharing horizons that are new to us, watching the signs along the way, talking it over, just the few of us, working together day to day, together. And when the evening comes, we smile, so much of life ahead. We'll find a place where there's room to grow. And yes, we've just begun sharing horizons that are new to us, watching. We've only just begun. These uh, verses, verses two through four from the Carpenters 1970 hit, set the stage for this message. According to our book of discipline, the heart of Christian ministry is Christ's ministry of outreaching love. Christian ministry is the expression of the mind and mission of Christ by a community of Christians that demonstrates a common life of gratitude and devotion, witness and service, celebration and discipleship. All Christians are called through their baptism to this service of uh, this ministry of servanthood. Additionally, the church as the community of the new covenant has participated in Christ's ministry of grace across the years and around the world. It stretches out to human needs wherever love and service may convey God's love and ours. The outreach of such ministries know no limits. But is that last statement actually true? Go, go, go. After reading how the United Methodist Book of Discipline depicts the heart of ministry and the ministry of the community or the church, I ask a rhetorical question. Is working in the church the same as working for the church? Well, is it? Again, that is rhetorical. Not too long ago, the Pew Research Center released a study showing a growing number of Americans primarily younger Americans turning away from God and or religion. According to the study, between 2007 and 2014, Americans who describe themselves as atheist or agnostic or of no particular faith grew from 16% to nearly 23%. And at the very same time, those who self-identify or profess to be Christians drop from about 78% to just under 71% of the population. And sadly, as of 2017, the numbers of nuns and duns, or what I like to refer to as don'ts and won'ts, continues to climb, while those who self-identify as Christian 
are still shrinking. If we take the time to read the first chapter of Acts, we hear Jesus command his disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. The promise being the arrival and, and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the, the outcome of which is you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Read the first chapter of Acts. You see, Jesus knew something about his that's us, disciples, that we, I mean, they may not have ever, ever publicly admitted. And that is that we cannot do the work if we have not been equipped and empowered for the work. I, I mean, his disciples knew what to speak, but they had not been prepared to actually speak yet. Jesus' disciples knew the story, but, but his story had not become their story yet. So today we, we come to the go of Pentecost, and, and as I was prayerfully studying the, the Pentecost story, the image of a knee-jerk reflex examination kept coming to my, my mind. For those unfamiliar with the knee-jerk reflex, this is a procedure in which a, a doctor will sharply strike the patellar tendon just below the kneecap. And as the response or lack thereof of movement in the leg indicates the possibility of a damage to the central nervous system, or maybe even the, a thyroid disease. Now, because I am not well-versed in medicine or the healing arts, I understand this knee-jerk reflex as the response of the patient to a, a stimulant administered by the doctor. The, the patient may feel just fine, but the response to the knee-jerk reflex may tell another story entirely. The patient may walk around believing that she or he is healthy, whole. However, it is their response to the hammer, to, to being struck, that re reveals the true nature of their condition. We have a Pentecost word from God today, and it is for all of us. And that word is that some of us Christians cannot carry Christ because we have not been adequately prepared for the task at hand. We need to be struck. Some of us Christians cannot carry Christ because we have not been equipped to do what Christ did, where Christ did it. And among those that Christ did it, oh, yes, we need to be struck. Go. We Christians are called to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's what my Bible says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. However, too many of us do not go because we have not really experienced that that heartwarming soul stirring life changing power from on high and the truth is that if we are not changed then we cannot change and folks around us will continue to shade Christ because they see many of us Christians 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 as shady we need to be struck today's passage of scripture while not traditionally preached on Pentecost is, in actuality, still a vital part of the Pentecost story. Now, leading up to today's pericope of, of Scripture, we have the followers of Jesus waiting expectantly for the promise, the promise arriving, the promise transforming or changing or striking Jesus' followers, and the promise equipping and empowering a, a struck a struck Peter to tell the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, Jesus knew the story, saints. Peter knew the story of Jesus, but when the Holy Spirit strikes Peter, Jesus' story becomes Peter's story. What do I mean? Jesus' story becomes Peter's story. I, I know someone listening today is wondering this very thing. Uh, Peter knew Jesus. Peter knew the Jesus story, 
Peter walked with Jesus and, and talked with Jesus for three years. He knew the story. Peter witnessed the miracles of Jesus healing the sick and, and feeding the hungry and, and raising the dead. He knew the story. Peter was with Jesus on the mountain. And he witnessed a transfigured or changed Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. He knows the story. Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times, abandoned Jesus during his time on the cross, and then ran with John to the empty tomb. He knows the story. Oh, yes, Peter knows the story. And Peter, who has heard Jesus ask him, do you love me three times? And then tells Peter to feed my lambs and tend my sheep and, and feed my sheep, church. Peter knows the story, but it's on this day of Pentecost when the Jesus story becomes Peter's story. It's on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls afresh on Peter that he understands that following Jesus means not just talking Jesus, but more importantly, walking Jesus. Oh, yes. It was on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit filled Peter that he knew telling the Jesus story meant also telling the Peter story. Somebody talk to me. Peter was struck. Peter had fallen three times and Jesus picked him up three times. Peter has deserted Jesus in his hour of need and Jesus has shown up when Peter needed him most. Peter has fled the flock. And now Jesus is teaching him how to be a shepherd to that flock. Oh, yes, church, the Jesus story became the Peter story, but even better yet, the Peter with Jesus story. And when Jesus' story becomes our story, then our story will become a story that touches whoo, or cuts the hearts of those who hear that story. I'm talking about believers becoming believable. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit equipping and empowering and filling us with a boldness that turns heads and turns hearts. I'm talking about being responsive to the Holy Spirit's power so that, so that others may respond in faith. Let me make this as plain or basic as possible. I believe that many, both Christians and non-Christians view our world through a lens of skepticism, pessimism, and yes, corruption. I believe that many, both Christians and non-Christians, have witnessed so many assaults on humanity, mm, so many instances of injustice. Somebody say the name Ahmad Arbery. So many occurrences of nobodies being reminded of their nobody nest. Somebody call out the name of Skylar Davis. That we have become in many instances numb to the power of the Holy Spirit. And for many of us, numbed ain'ts. I said numbed ain'ts. It begins with our perceived impotence of the church. And since I'm on my soapbox, let us go one step further. If the church did not have such a gory rather than gloried history, then maybe those seeking purpose or relevance would not view the church so irreverently. Make no mistake, the Christian church will go, but all too often it is the hypocrisy found in many of our bureaucracies that has alienated not one, not two, but now three generations of people. Yes, church, the hypocrisy of the church is the primary reason we have such an alarming number of unaffiliated or nuns. The Christian church, the Christian church professes a Christ-like love and, and often has been the instrument of hate. The Christian church professes a Christ-like love and often has been the seat of condemnation. The, the Christian church professes a Christ-like love and has been the hammer keeping out societies marginalized and, and ostracized. You know, we good church folks have, have become a beast to the least, too fast for the last, and a boss to the lost. We need to be struck. Too many ain'ts have been wounded by the saints. Too many ain'ts have been pushed down and, and pushed around by the saints. Too many ain'ts have been broken up 
and broken down by those same saints. Yes, saints, for many ain'ts, there's no difference between how they are being viewed by the church or the world. Because both the world and the church have used, misused, and abused too many individuals, too many communities, too many families, and as a result, too many churches are now museums or mausoleums instead of wellsprings of hope and love. We need to be struck. And when we are struck, when we are truly responsive to the grace-filled outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a, a different kind of response will arise in those who hear our story. The scriptures tell us that when Peter told his story, the hearers were cut to the heart, asking, what should we do? To which Peter replies, repent, be baptized, be forgiven, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Get this now. The responses of repenting and, and being baptized and, and accepting forgiveness and even the reception of the Holy Spirit are not something that the people, any people, including us good people, can do on our own. No church, we are able to respond because the Holy Spirit provides the grace-filled room and stimulus for us to respond. It was after, after they heard the story that they asked the question, and it was in the question that Peter was, off, was able to offer this divinely inspired guidance. Now, now, maybe someone uh, heard that or it went past somebody. So let me say it again. We repent because the Holy Spirit allows us the room and gives us the stimulus to turn back to the Lord. And our baptism in the name of Jesus and forgiveness of sins is possible because the Holy Spirit allows us the space and gives us the stimulus to become one with Christ. We respond in faith to that presence that moves us to what we could never, ever, ever, ever do and moves us to feel what we could never, ever, ever, ever feel and moves us to go where we could never, ever, ever go on our own. I'm talking about being struck right now, saints. And maybe it's just me, but it seems like there must have been something about the movement on the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit on that day and in that place and on those people, because the text tell us that as a result of this outpouring, 3,000, that's three with three zeros, welcome Peter's message and are baptized. They were struck. That day, 3,000 heard the story. That day, 3,000 believed the story. That day, 3,000 were moved by the story. And 3,000 became one with the story. Oh, yes, they were struck. Don't tell me the church is dead. As long as the Holy Spirit lives, then we live. As long as the Holy Spirit moves, then we move. As long as the Holy Spirit transforms, then we transform. As long as the Holy Spirit goes, we go. Someone here today needs to know that there is real power in the Holy Spirit. I said there's power, real power in the Holy Spirit. When the, the Spirit strikes us, then we are equipped to work in the church and for the church. When the Spirit strikes us, then we are empowered to tell our story in the presence of the saints whoo, and the presence of the ain'ts. When the Spirit strikes us, then we are filled with a holy boldness that allows us to speak truth to power inside the church and even in the world. I'm talking about being struck and then going or striking out. When the Spirit strikes us, then we become believable believers. When the Spirit strikes us, then we become changed, change agents. When the Spirit strikes us, then we will speak what thus saith the Lord, unafraid and unashamed. When the Spirit strikes us, then we will look forward to learning the Word and, and partaking in the Lord's Supper and will feel unfulfilled if we cannot get to a church house and be around some saints of God. When the Spirit strikes us, then we will hug the unhuggable Ooh. and love the unlovable right there in the neighborhood. 
where the missional outpost called the church house is located. But it gets even better. We are told that this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. That means that the Holy Spirit will strike us and strike our homes and strike our neighborhoods. That means the Holy Spirit will strike in Brooklyn and in Hartford, in Pleasantville and in Southington, in Harlem and in Westport, in Staten Island and in Long Island, in Greenwich and Bowling Green and Orange and even White Plains, in the state of Connecticut and New York, in the United States of America and across the globe. And with the strike comes a change. Mothers, when the strike comes, your child will rise up and call you blessed. Fathers, when the strike comes, your, your child will honor you that their days may be long. Children, when your parents are struck, they will, will, they will become sheroes and heroes. Someone here today can feel something happening right now. You, you can't put words to it, but you know, you just know the Spirit is calling you to go and do something right now. You can make Jesus' story a part of your story right now. You can hold on to someone who has already fought the battle on your behalf right now. You can become one with a Christ who loved you enough to die for your sins and then love you even more in defeating death so that you might have life and have it for, for eternity. If you're there, I invite you to go. Hallelujah. Listen to and go with that voice calling you by your name. Listen to and go with that voice that's calling you out of your depression and calling you out of your emptiness and calling you out of your hopelessness. Listen to the Holy Spirit and go with Jesus. And to all I say, amen and shalom.
friends, please join me in a moment of silence for Ahmed Arbery, for Breonna Taylor, for Tony McDade, for George Floyd, and for countless other lives taken unjustly and unexpectedly because of the color of their skin. Will you join me now in prayer? O oh God of us all, we call you by your name, the great physician, the healer of our hearts, and the balm for our souls. We thank you for another opportunity to greet the sunrise and breathe your gift of life into our lungs. We thank you for holding us in the center of your powerful and unchanging love. We thank you for hope, for mercy, and most of all for your grace in these times. Oh God, we ask you to hear our prayers. For the sick and the infected, God, we ask for healing in their bodies and to sustain their spirits. For our vulnerable populations, God, we ask you for protection for our elderly, for those with weakened immune systems, and those who are especially vulnerable to this virus. For the young and for the strong, God, give them compassion to help their neighbors who may be suffering. Give them eyes to see how they can be a helping hand and a witness of your love and hope. For the unemployed and the uninsured, God, inspire the church to support them with our resources. Give them comfort in this time of uncertainty and fear of what the future could hold for them. For those who are struggling with mental health challenges at this time and who feel isolated, anxious, and helpless, God, provide them with every necessary support. For the homeless, unable to practice the protocols of social distancing, protect them from disease and provide them with safety, shelter, and all that they may need. For the hungry and the food insecure, God, connect them to food pantries, feeding campaigns, and food banks. For families with children at home, God, Help the mothers and the fathers, the parents, the guardians, and grandparents to partner together creatively for the care and flourishing of their children. For single mothers and fathers, grow their networks of support so they can find rest and renewal. For our pastors and the leaders of our churches, God, give them the rest they deserve. They have not been trained or prepared to lead your church in this time. Help us to be generous with our leaders and supporting of their efforts to lead through a time of uncertainty and fear. For the church who is looking for your word and your voice in this time, guide us, lead us, help us to be courageous, to include all people, no matter the color of their skin. God, we praise you for hope eternal and for hope right now. We praise you for your grace, mercy, and compassion. We praise you for new beginnings and second chances. We praise you for the great cloud of witnesses and the encouragers and supporters in our lives right now. And most of all, we praise you for your powerful love that holds us, covers us, renews us, and empowers us. We thank you for your help in the sanctuary of our hearts and for receiving the prayers of our hearts and the deep sighs of our souls. And we will give you all the thanks and praise for all of these things and more. In the name of God, our Father and Mother, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Now, friends, as we depart from this service, acknowledging that much work has been done and much work needs to be done, let us go remembering and reaffirming the vows made at our baptism. Let us go forth renouncing the spiritual forces of wickedness, rejecting the evil powers of this world, and repenting of our sin. Let us go accepting the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And let us go, confessing Jesus Christ as our Savior, putting our whole trust in His grace, and promising to serve Him as Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Let us go. May it be so. Amen. Sure.